Welcome back to our class on machine translation. This is the second lecture. Um, this lecture actually is not going to cover much in terms of machine translation. We're just going to lay the foundation about some basics you should be familiar with in language and probability. You may actually know most of these things or some of these things, so feel free to skip through material you're already familiar with. Let me start with two quotes that underpin a debate in computational linguistics. So the first quote is from Noam Chomsky, uh, the famous linguist and also political activist, who uh, wrote, it must be recognized that the notion probability of a sentence is an entirely useless one under any known interpretation of this term. And another quote uh, attributed to Frederick Jelinek, who was one of the pioneers in, behind both speech recognition and machine translation, and also a professor at Johns Hopkins University until his death a few years ago. He is uh, famous for, one of the things he's famous for is this quote, whenever I fire a linguist, our system performance improves. So there's a clear conflict here between how much is natural language processing, the idea of building computer systems with that, that can handle language, how much should there be linguistic systems or how much there should be probabilistic data-driven systems. And uh, this is a rather interesting debate in the field. And there's uh, various ways how you can frame this conflict. So one way to frame it is as rationalist versus empiricist. So rationalist is, trying, is the program to try to understand language. Can you rationalize how a language works? Can you get a reasonable account of the functions of language? Whereas empiricists are more interested in what language does actually occur? How can we learn from the data that is out there? and uh, explain it as just an event that produces data. There's also the conflict between the scientist and the engineer. So it's the goal of dealing with problems like machine translation, a scientific endeavor that is gonna tell us something about the world. Or is it an engineering discipline where we just wanna build an application, a system that does something useful and we don't, we're gonna get there by any means necessary without necessarily having to have any deep understanding of the problem. Another way to frame it is insight with this data analysis. Um, are we actually trying to gain some deep insights into the nature of language or is this just a data analysis problem where we're just trying to find patterns? So are we ultimately trying to explain language or we're trying to build applications? So uh, let me first actually cover these two big themes. First, we're going to talk about language, and then we're going to talk about probability theory and uh, methods relevant to uh, the systems we're going to develop. So you need to have at least some understanding of either, no matter where you fall on that debate. So let's first take a fairly naive view of language. So language needs to name things um, such as objects in the world, uh, these are called nouns. So we have words like dog and cat and house and even names like Bill and Joe. Then actions, jump, run, talk, listen. And then properties of objects and actions. So brown, quickly. So these are called adjectives and adverbs. Adjectives are properties of nouns and adverbs are properties of actions. So these are kind of the objects, actions, and properties of the world. And then language also has something that helps to clarify the relationship between these. So there are various ways language can do this. One is word order. So when I see, say, man bites dog, in English, it's clear who's doing the action, who is the action acted upon. Uh, but it might also be morphology. Morphology also plays other roles, for instance, dog, dogs, having plural, multiple dogs, 
past tense of verbs and so on. And then there are also function words. So if you look at just the screen, there are words like to, of, a, these are all function words. They are kind of the glue that also helps to tie everything together. So if you just kind of look at these words here, so these are all content words that either describe objects, actions, or properties. You have quick and dog and fox and lazy and brown. So these are kind of, if I want to explain and say a sentence, these may be all the content words I'm going to use. So there's a relationship between them, and I can draw them with lines. I can say there is the word jump that is somewhat central to the sentence and has two connections, one dog, the one that is doing the jumping uh, or is jumped over, and the other one is fox. So maybe that's the one that's doing the jumping or is jumped over. Um, and then the fox also has some properties. He's brown and he's quick and the dog also has a property. He's lazy. So what I just explained is how these words connect and this has to be expressed in language in some way. So let's just go with the word order first. Quick brown fox, jump lazy dog. That is almost a pretty well-formed English sentence. Um, you're going to have some problems when you're used to English. There's some pieces missing. So one is here, maybe you want to say jump over the lazy dog, because jumping a dog is not quite clear what that means. Jumping over, this is kind of a refinement of the word jump. Arguably, this is really part of the word jump. Jump and jump over maybe are different actions. Then there is morphology. So um, there is a fox that is doing the jumping. It's in singular. So the verb also has to be in singular. So it's jumps. If it would be multiple foxes, quick brown foxes jump over the later dogs, then you wouldn't have that. So this clarifies also the relationship to between the subject fox and the verb jump. And then some nuance. So the quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog. So you're adding these determiners. So what role do they play? And uh, you might be surprised to know that there are languages like Chinese that don't have determiners. So they're not nearly necessary. In English, they definitely clarify if uh, you, an object you're talking about is a specific object or object I named before, then I would use the word the, or if it's a new object you introduce. And then you would say a, or if it's just some any any arbitrary object that doesn't really matter, then you would use a. So there are also other ways of marking relationships. Um, we already looked at uh, English noun verb agreement, subject verb agreement, where you had fox and jumps, and because fox is singular, jumps has to be also singular, so there's some agreement, but it's really not a major feature of English. If you look here at another example here, a sentence from Cotal, uh, a book written in Latin over 2000 years ago, where um, if I just kind of go over the words, I let me just read that and then I'll explain how morphology helps to establish the relationships between everything. So whom I present lovely, new, little book, dry manner, pumice polished. So what is doing what and what am I doing and what's going on? So there's some presenting, something is being presented and uh, something is polished and uh, there's a book in pumice, which is something apparently that helps you polish things. And how are these relationships between words uh, uh, established? So you can see at the word endings. So you have here libellum, the book, and it's novum, also ends in um, lepidum, it's lovely. So these are all properties of the book, since they both end the same way. Um, that's a clear indication 
that uh, there are properties of the book and not properties of something else in the sentence. Um, they're also next to each other, that helps. But if you look at the last word, expolitum, it's actually not next to a book, it's actually quite far removed. But since it also ends in um, we know it is also related. Uh, also, similarly, um, you have your pumice, and it has relationships to uh, the dry manner here. So you can see here how um, this is called case marking, how um, morphologically inflection can help uh, to explain the relationships between words. So Latin actually allows that a word like novum could be completely out of place and modify this pumice here, maybe it's new pumice, but then it would have a different ending. Um, the morphology also allows us to mark relationships to verbs. Again, this is not a big feature of English. Uh, English has very little cases as the genitive case, and you see kind of traces of cases in uh, that you do a you use a different word for he and him and him himself. Um, other languages like German have fairly strong handling of case and that allows us to actually put words in different word order. So let's look at the sentence here. Die Frau gibt dem Mann den Apfel. So this is, you would actually literally translate this word by word into English as the woman gives the man the apple. But in German it's also possible to start the sentence with uh, the object. So this is what's happening here. Der Frau gibt der Mann den Apfel. So if you look at this, this looks exactly the same. And you really have to look closely and notice that here you have D and here you have der. And you have here you have dem and here you have der. So that seems to indicate something. And what that indicates to a German speaker pretty clearly is that in the second case, the subject is actually coming after the verb der Mann. That is called nominative case. So this is the subject. So this is actually the one that's doing the giving while the woman is in the indirect object. So that's also clear from the determiner there. So case inflection also allows you to establish relationship between words. So Arguably, there is some kind of smooth transition between case morphology and preposition. So that's another way to establish relationship. So you can say, the woman gives the man the apple. Or you can say, the woman gives the apple to the man. These are both perfectly fine English sentences. So that shows that there's some flexibility in English, even how do you arrange here the two objects of the sentence or in the second case, you actually frame that as an object and a prepositional phrase. And um, there are two ways to do it. So in the first case, you did it by word order. And the second case, you do it by this preposition. And uh, as I said, a preposition in case morphology is kind of similar. So you have a noun phrase, the man, and you kind of mark it as being the recipient and not the thing that's being given um, in the sentence. And you do this by this preposition too. And in other languages, you might do this with a case inflection. In Germany, you actually would do this with case inflection. Um, and to just give you one example where it's not quite clear what are prepositions and what's case morphology, these are Japanese sentences here, where you have woman, man, apple, gifts. And there's always one marker at the end of each noun that uh, indicates what the role that noun has in the sentence. And uh, is this morphology or are these postpositional marker words? Uh, that's up to you to call it. Um, they're typically considered marker words in Japanese. Okay, let us just take a bit of a big picture view about the kind of linguistic analysis we typically carry out when you want to build more sophisticated natural language processing systems. 
So here is a simple sentence. Uh, these are just the words of the sentence. So this is how we actually write things down and observe. Then we just already talked about morphology. So is is a particular form of the word to be. It's a single, uh, it's a third person singular present tense. Third person singular present tense. Um, you could also say that a uh, sentence is a singular noun. Then uh, there's uh, something called part of speech. Uh, where we just kind of classify uh, words into the categories you already introduced. So is is a verb, uh, sentence a noun, and this is an adjective. It's kind of a uh, classic early used uh, uh, acronym for that is JJ, adjective. There's a J in it. Uh, a is a bit too ambiguous um, between adverb and adjective. And uh, then you have actually two determiners. Next, the syntax. So this introduces concepts like noun phrase that group together a couple of words here, um, the phrase a simple sentence, and uh, declares them one unit that has, plays a particular role in the sentence. It also has concepts like verb phrase, which is the verb and its objects, and on top of there you have a sentence node. So then there is this wide field of semantics. Um, let's just, at this point, just talk about lexical semantics. So when you have words like sentence, then can have multiple meaning. There's the, for instance, the concept of a prison sentence. Here, sentence means a string of words satisfying the grammatical rules of a language. And you also have the word simple, which has all kinds of meanings here as being having few parts. Um, that's the meaning for this word here. Um, this is uh, how far we go within a sentence, um, then, but we can also go between sentences. So if you have another sentence here, but it is an instructive one, then what is the relationship between these two sentences? And there's a theory of discourse relationship that would say this is a contrast. So you have the sentence, this is a simple sentence, kind of making the claim the sentence very simple. And then here you have a contrast, although it's being simple, it's actually instructive. So we're establishing here a contrast between these two statements. So why is language hard? So one is that there are ambiguities on many levels. This is a probably the key property of language. Pretty much everything is ambiguous. Words are ambiguous, they have many different meanings. Syntactic structures are ambiguous, they could be uh, interpreted different ways. Um, then there seem to be rules in language and grammar rules. If you paid attention in elementary, middle school, you probably learned a lot about grammar, but you also realized there are many exceptions to it. And we can say completely ungrammatical things and still be perfectly understandable. And in general, we don't really have a good understanding how humans process language. So can we, the question now is, can we learn something about language by doing automatic data analysis? So is the kind of data-driven work we do ultimately to build machine translation systems in our case, also helpful to reveal something about language. And there's certainly some discoveries you can make about language by looking at actually large corpora of data and collecting statistics. There's a subfield of linguistics called corpus linguistics that is mainly concerned with what kind of phenomena show up, how frequently in, in, in actual text, and what does it reveal about language. Okay. That was kind of the linguistic view of language. Now we're gonna have the data view of language, uh, fairly short, and uh, we'll actually conclude with uh, more methods in statistics you should be familiar with because we're gonna use them throughout this class. Okay, data. So what is data? Um, well, the data view of language is probably, we have 
a bunch of words. We have a, a word is, let's define it as a string of letters separated by spaces. And that's a good working operation, although there is uh, some details you have to worry about. So one is what do you do with punctuation. So if you say uh, letters separate by space is then the colon part of the word definition. No, it's not. So punctuation, we typically want to split off. This is a process called tokenization. Then there are things like hyphen, high risk. Should we split that off? This is actually an open domain, the open debate if you should treat this as two words or one word. Um, it probably depends a bit on your application and uh, if it matters that you have a lot of rare uh, infrequent words or not. Then there are things like clitics. So here the genitive marker, Joe's. Uh, should you split that off? And in actual natural language processing of English, you actually tend to split that off and say Joe is one word and then this uh, quote is, is the other word. And then there's compounds, which exist in English. I don't fully understand how it works in English. It, uh, it happens. Words like homework and website are written as one word. But in generally, if you have two nouns next to each other, you keep them separately. But there are other languages, like famously German, that less loves to put word nouns together. So computer linguistic vorlesung means a lecture on computational linguistics. And it's all just one word. And why shouldn't it be one word? It's one concept. And then there are languages like Chinese that just don't make any spaces at all. Um, so here the definition of a string of letters separated by spaces doesn't really work. So ultimately, you would define a word maybe as some kind of atomic unit of meaning, although then you run into problems with how is a, a morphology play a role, or morphemes, atomic units of meaning, or they're part of a word. OK, um, a bit more tricky than you may, might first think, but if you focus on English and deal with some special cases, uh, it's somewhat a doable concept. So what, if, what happens if you actually look at words in a corpus? So here we look at uh, English corpus uh, from uh, proceedings of the European Parliament. Uh, that's a fairly famous corpus in the development of machine translation because it's a fairly large corpus of translated text. Anyway, here we just look at the English and we just say, what are the most frequent words? And if you just go by any word, you get the most frequent word in English is the. So since we typically treat punctuation just like any other word, and maybe then we shouldn't call them words, but we should call them tokens. Uh, these are the second and third most frequent. And then you get a lot of prepositions of to connect this like and and so on. OK, and that's actually pretty independent of what kind of corpus of English text you get. You're going to get similar statistics. If you look at the nouns in this particular corpus, you see very clearly the content matter of the corpus. So the most frequent noun here is European and Mr. and Commission and President and Parliament. So that reveals a lot about the text we're doing here. So one striking thing to observe, though, is that you get a very similar distribution of the relative counts. So you have the top one here that is uh, almost twice as many as the third one. And then the third one is twice as many as the last one. And what do we have a noun? So we have the first one. It doesn't stick out as much, but still, it's probably about twice as many as around these here. And then that is also uh, it's several times. It's quite a bit bigger than the last one here. So these are interesting counts. So you have some words that are super frequent, and it does seem to fall off. On the other hand, there's also a large tail of words that occur exactly once in this particular corpus. So in this particular corpus, there are 33,447 words that occur exactly once. And they're not really crazy words. They're words like cornflakes, mathematicians, Tajikistan. And I mean, these are words that uh, you're familiar with, uh, shouldn't have a problem understanding. 
but maybe they're just because of the subject matter of what people talk about in the European Parliament, they're just not as frequent. Um, this leads us to Zipp's law. So there are not many laws in linguistics, but here's one. Um, it claims that the frequency of a word, so the word counts that we looked at, multiplied with the rank of a word. If you saw the words, so this is the first word, most, first most frequent word, second most frequent word, third most frequent word, is a constant. So basically says, if you go back to these slides here, if you multiply one, um, one times this number here, and two times this number here, and three times this number here, and four times this number here, and five times this number here, you get always roughly the same number. So if you just look at this line here, five times this, that also gets you uh, close to about four million, which is the same as the one above. Uh, doesn't quite work out. Your 10 times that also gets you about 4 million. So um, one way to plot this is here as a graph. So this is Zipf's law as a graph. Um, so we had here Zipf's law as it is expressed. Um, and uh, maybe we should say two things about the graph. So you have on the bottom, you have the rank of the word. So one is the most frequent word and then 10 is the 10th most frequent word and so on. And then you have a lot of words here at the end that uh, are kind of uh, the least frequent words. Uh, they all occur one time. So that's why you have this line here. These are all the words that occur two times. Um, this is in log scale. So you see 1, 10, 100, 1,000, not 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And it's also in log scale uh, in, in this direction here. So, so why is this? If you plot it this way, why is this coming out as, well, roughly a line? So it's not completely a straight line, but it's uh, pretty much a line. So if you actually do a little bit of math on the, on the equation here, then you can rewrite that as this. And uh, that if you you know, take the log of both sides, you get your log f equals log k minus log r. So you have the log f, which we plot in the one axis, the y axis, and log r, which is we plot here on the x axis. There's a re linear relationship with this constant here as uh, additional um, uh, additive uh, value to it. So that's quite striking. Um, this is true for any kind of corpus you collect for any language um, and has a couple of implications. So um, yeah, so there's going to be some words that are super frequent. That's not a bad thing. But there are always going to be some words that are super rare, and that's a problem. So no matter how big your corpus is, there are going to be a lot of rare words, and you don't know what to do with them, and you don't learn much about them because you don't see them very often. So let's uh, introduce some concept of statistics that are going to be useful throughout this class uh, going forward. So one uh, mathematical concept we're going to deal with a lot are probabilities. So um, given the word counts that we just estimate that we just looked at for how frequent words are, we can actually do things like estimating probability distributions. So we look at the count of a word, for instance, the word the, and then we look at the sum over the count of all the other words. And that gives us the probability, if I pick any word out of a text, what's the probability that I pick the word the? Um, this way of estimating a probability distribution is called maximum likelihood estimation. Why does it have this complicated name? Well, we'll get to that a little bit later. So estimating probabilities based on frequencies is also called the frequentist approach to probabilities. This uh, probability distribution answers the question, as I already said, if we randomly pick a word out of a text, how likely will it be the word W? Uh, in a formal, uh, we introduce a random variable, big W, 
and we define a probability distribution p that tells us how likely the variable w has the value of the word lower small w so the probability that this random variable has this value is this number that's the definition of a probability distribution so we might be also interested in joint probabilities especially in language words don't occur in isolation they occur in sequences and uh, well, the simplest sequence is a bigram two words next to each other so the words w1 and the w W2 occur in a sequence called a bigram. Um, so we can model this with a distribution prob probability of W1, W2. If the occurrence of words in bigrams would be independent, we could reduce this to uh, probability of word one and word two following each other is the same as the probability of word one occurring and the probability of word two occurring so intuitively this is not the case for bigrams um, if you know a word it kind of limits pretty heavily what the next word is just kind of think about the most frequent word the it's the most frequent word so the the should also be pretty frequent but the the is actually extremely rare you don't really say the the we can estimate joint probabilities over two variables the same way we estimate the probability distribution over a single variable. So we're just gonna do now, let's just count up all the bigrams. So there we actually would count in a corpus how often does the, the occur and we realize actually it doesn't occur very often. So that's gonna get a, a fairly low probability. Conditional probabilities is another useful concept. So here now we look at the probability of where two occurring given that word one just occurred so given that the word the occurred what word would follow so it answers the question if a random variable big w i the big w I, one is w one what is the value for the second random variable w2 mathematically we can define a conditional probability in this way and that pretty much already says everything you really need to know from a mathematical point of view so you have the probability distribution the joint probability distribution of w1 w2 how do often do they occur in a sequence divided by the probability of word one that gives you the probability of word two given word one if w1 and w2 were independent then uh, we could actually ignore that context and that's kind of intuitive if w2 is independent of what w1 is then you don't actually need to uh, factor that in and you can just say probability of w2 so um, this uh, gives us the chain rule this is just a mathematical reformulation pretty much of the definition of conditional probabilities so if you say probability of word two given word one is defined as follows then we can also do a little bit mathematical mumbo jumbo here basically move this here to the front and we're gonna get probability of word one times probability of word two given word one is the same as the probability of that sequence so if you want to try and break down even larger joint probabilities we can do the same thing. We can compute this as the probability of the first word, the probability of the second word given the first word, and then the probability of the third word given the first two. Okay, one more concept um, we'll introduce is the base rule. This is also um, pretty much just some uh, playing around with what conditional probabilities are so the probability of x given y is can be rewritten as the probability of y given x times the probability of x divided by the probability of y why we want to do that there are actually a bunch of good reasons why that is a pretty handy way that allows us to reformulate uh, a bunch of problems it's mathematically not very completely complicated it's easily derived from the chain rule so if you just say probability of the, the joint probability is the joint probability that's just identity anyway 
and then um, apply the chain rule just in different ways probability of x given y times probability of y probability of y given x times probability of x and that gives you then um, this here the base rule okay another concept uh, that's useful is expectation so we introduced the concept of the random variable x and uh, it uh, it's a random variable it can have multiple values and then for each of the possible values you have we have a probability value associated with that to take a much simpler example in language let's just roll look at the roll of a dice so there is a one sixth chance that will come up as one two three four five six so the expectation is uh, computed as follows so the expectation for random variables so we sum over all the possible values we can have and take the probability of that value times what the actual value is obviously this only works for values distributions over numbers so if you predict uh, uh, if the probability gives the random variable all the possible values are numbers which are the case here so if you look at that here and multiply it out you end up with 3.5 and uh, one way to think about this, this is kind of the average value you get if you roll a dice obviously you're never actually going to get 3.5 because that's not on a dice but if you roll a dice a thousand times and add up everything you're probably going to get something similar to 3500 Variance is a related uh, concept um, that tells us a little bit how, of how much values deviate from the mean, so the expectation we just computed. And uh, it's a, a bit complicated the way we define it. So we look at, uh, again, all the possible values uh, for um, a random variable. We look at the probability of that and then we check how different it is how is the difference between x and the expectation for x so that's the mean and then we square that so that's a bit more complicated the squaring does have the advantage that we don't have to worry about if this is a positive value or negative value if we don't want to know if it's yeah, we, we want to know how far it is from the mean but we don't really care if it's bigger than the mean or smaller than the mean and squaring is one way to accomplish that so intuitively, this is the measure how events diverge from the mean. So there's also something called standard deviation, which is pretty much the same thing, except uh, it's a square root of that. Well, you kind of undo the squaring here by uh, defining uh, a standard deviation uh, as the square root of variance x. So. Okay, and uh, the expectation is the mean. So now we have nice Greek letters. Uh, let's do the roll of a dice. What's the variance? And here is kind of uh, the computation of the variance for the roll of a dice. So we, in each case, we take uh, the probability of the event, with events, which is always one sixth. And uh, we subtract from the mean, uh, subtract the mean from each value. So one minus 3.5, two minus 3.5, three minus 3.5, and so on. So this gives us all the different values, and uh, that then uh, gives us in the first case minus 2.5, minus 1.5, and so on. And you square it, and then you see the distances here, and you just take the average of that because all the probabilities have the same probability. Okay, um, there's a bunch of distributions. Uh, so we talk about probability distributions, um, uh, mostly so far as we can estimate from counts and data, but they're also just theoretical distributions that are very, very much, much simpler, that have a few parameters um, that come in handy. One is uniform. So if you have all possible values, for a variable so all the possible events that can happen are equally likely that's a uniform distribution that's actually the the roll of a dice is an example for that 
and then uh, there are uh, binomial distributions that are used for a series of trials that have only two outcomes and uh, so then it's always the question the probability of the outcome happening or the opposite of the outcome happening so this can be used for a number of coin costs so this answers questions like if I flip a coin 20 times what's the probability that heads comes up eight times so here's the formula for that uh, another standard distribution that is extremely popular is the normal distribution and uh, it has a very wacky complicated formula here um, but uh, it's, it's kind of well known for its shape it's also called a bell curve so it has a peak in the middle and then it kind of falls off to each side um, so the, the, the round curve is kind of defined by the E and then um, the squaring here of a value minus the mean uh, ensures that uh, the curve kind of looks the same in both directions and then there's just a bunch of additional values in there um, the key um, concept in there is here we have the mean so we always look at how often the random variable differs from the mean um, we square that so we don't care about which direction it goes just how far it is from the mean and um, um, then uh, here's the variance computed in so that uh, uh, gives you a sense of how far this curve stretches out to the left and the right and um, then there's some other terms thrown in here for good measure why not, why not the square root of pi hey so um, this is used for a lot of things if you basically collect statistics about heights of people um, you're going to get the normal distribution um, famously the IQ of people or whatever IQ really is uh, gives you distribution but also if you look at trees of a particular species and look at the height um, when they're fully grown how, how they differ from each other you get this kind of distribution so um, let's uh, revisit uh, now it's more heavily armed with um, concepts from probability theory let's revisit how we can do estimation so we introduced an estimation of probabilities based on frequencies so this is what we have done here so we just went by count so we take the count of a event w and divide by the count of any event so when the occurs 10,000 times in a million word corpus that means 10,000 divided by a million that gives us 0 0.015 um, another way you can estimate is uh, the Bayesian view so this is uh, answering the question and this is a bit wacky to think about it is what's the probability of a model given the data so we have some data we see and we can also think about all kinds of models models here meaning values assigned to a probability distribution so if I assign some values to a probability distribution and here's some data is this the best model or what's the like what's the probability of the model so this is kind of introduced as a concept here so so both model and data are random variables so both model and data are random variables models you can probably see as being a random variable you can come up with all kinds of models so the model can take on uh, different values but then also data it can uh, take on different values basically you can look at different kinds of data so we're interested in this uh, formulation of probability of model given data because we want to have the best possible model so this is ultimately what we want to get to here we want to have the maximum model the model that maximizes probability we want to have the model m that gives us the highest probability uh, given the data so here's the plan so we take the probability of the model given the data and use Bayes rule to reformulate it this way so be interested again in the arc max here what's the best possible model given the data 
So just like we applied the base rule up here, we are now gonna apply the base rule here, and uh, it's just pretty much just putting arc marks in front of it. But you also notice that we dropped the probability of D because the data is given. We have a set of data that we're dealing with, so the probability for the data is irrelevant. What's, what we, the choice we have is the probability of the model. So you have various models to choose from, and we want to, that's the thing that varies, and that's the one we have to deal with. So since we're only interested in the ArcMax, we can actually simply drop that. So we're left with the probability of the data given the model and the probability of the model. The probability of the data given the model is very easy to compute. If you have a model, you can then assign a probability to each data point, and this is just then the product of all these probabilities. Um, more interestingly is the probability of the model. So we are interested in answering the question here, what is the most likely model given the data? And what this reformulation allows us is to introduce a prior of the probability of a model by itself. So this like sounds a bit of a strange concept, but assume there's a problem that you have some kind of insight in. So you can then say, well, I generally prefer these kind of models. Um, this is actually a very common technique um, the most often application in machine learning is some kind of prior that prefers simple models. There's the famous Occam's razor, we prefer a simple model. If they have multiple explanations, we prefer the simple one. In machine learning, it's mostly driven by, I want to have a few, as few as parameters as possible, or I have a lot of uh, fewest parameter that actually have significant values. I want to zero out other parameters that don't matter. If I have uh, a simple explanation is better. So this combats overfitting in machine learning. So um, how does this differ from the frequentist estimation we have done so far? Well, if you make this Bayesian estimation and have a uniform prior, so that's where the probability of the model actually doesn't matter. No matter what model you have, it's the same value, then um, the probability of the model of the data uh, is uh, the arcmax of that is equivalent to the arcmax uh, over the probability of the data given the model. So if this here drops out in the formulation up there, you lift with that. So you want to have the model that maximizes that. So it's the most likely model given the data. So this is, therefore it's called the maximum likelihood estimation. Okay, another useful contents to introduce is entropy. We'll see actually a lot of variants of entropy. So in the simplest form, let's just introduce it. Um, it's just the entropy of a probability distribution. So um, a probability distribution has different values, and there is this rather complicated formula here that uh, goes over each item in the probability distribution and does the log two of the probability and then also multiplies that with the probability and then there's also a negative sign in there. It's a measure for the degree of disorder and I think it's more useful to just look at a bunch of examples and see what happens. So if you only have one event, if you only have a single event, then the probability of that event is one. It's only one event. That's the only thing that can happen. It's certain that that's happened. What happens to entropy then? Well, you have this minus one log one. That's what's going on in there. So this is the probability of the model and then the log probability. Uh, log of one is zero. So this end, ends up being zero. So if, it's, if they have absolutely certainty, this is actually not really a probabilistic event. So if you have absolutely certainty, then the entropy is zero. What if you have two equally likely events? So you have two events, A and B, and they all have, both have probability of 0 0.5, and you do some number crunching here, and entropy turns out to be 1. 
if you have four equally likely events, then the probability of each event is 0 0.25. Do the number crunching here, and you end up with two. Um, if you have enough background in computer science and remember it, this is very much related to information content. So if you have to encode four different items, how many bits do you need? You need two bits. So you're going to encode one of these items is 0, 0, and the next one is 0, 1, and then it's 1, 0, and 1, 1. So with two bits, you can encode what these different events are. And uh, so you need two bits for that. So if they are equally likely, that's actually the optimal way to encode it. OK, what if things are a bit more skewed? So again, you have four um, events. So now you have four events, except one is more probable than the other. So here's a bit of a picture. So you have the most probable event here. And then the other ones are, are less probable. So if we do the number crunching on that here, we end up with 1.35. So uh, if you remember, if you had two events, the entropy of that was one. If you had four events that are equal like, the entropy was two. So we end up somewhere here in the middle between the two. OK, let's push this a little bit further and make one event super duper more likely than the other. So one event is 0 0.97, so pretty much that's always going to happen unless, for some rare cases, other stuff happens. Um, here's your number crunching, and you end up with 0 0.24. So again, in the scale of absolute, absolute certainty, um, where you have entropy of 0, you have two equally divines, one, four events are equally likely to maybe end up somewhere much closer to 0. And that uh, gives you a sense of what it's meant by entropy as a measurement of disorder. So if it's almost certain that A is going to happen here, then there's not much disorder here. There's a lot of certainty. And so the 0 0.24 reflects that um, as uh, not really all being all that disorderly. OK. Um, here are all the examples. I also threw in for good measure, and I, you probably saw that coming. If you put in eight events here, entropy is three. You need three bits to encode eight possible values. OK, so why are we introducing entropy in this context? Because um, we think about a model, a good model has low entropy. Is a, mo a model. We want to build models that makes certain decisions and uh, certain about the outcomes, and it's not very confused. So if you have a translation table that says, if you have the foreign word there, then the is a probability, uh, is a, a translation with a probability of 0 0.8, and that is a translation with a probability of 0 0.2. If you look at this uh, distribution here, you will say this has a fairly low entropy, probably going to be somewhere between 0 and 1. Um, so this is better than a model that looks like this here, where, well, probably the, this is the most likely, but I'm not sure about this, and I'm not sure about that one either, and there might be other things I'm also not sure about. And then this is going to have a much higher entropy. So. A lot of statistical estimation is about reducing entropy. And we actually often directly optimize or track progress on our model is how does entropy improve over time? Um, I already alluded to that here, uh, the relationship of information theory and entropy. So if you encode a sequence of events x and each event is invented by a sequence of bits. Um, so then maybe you want to do coin flips by saying heads is 0, tails is 1. If you have equally likely events, we actually spell that out. This is how you can encode those. If you have three events and one is more likely than the other, then you would say uh, you probably only use one bit for the more frequent event and two bits for the less frequent events. 
this actually gets you very close to also how compression algorithms work. So they look at your data and see, oh, well, there's this is one sequence that repeats over and over and over again. Let's just find, encode that with a short code. Well, uh, longer, extremely rare sequences, I can have longer codes for that. Um, it's also done by humans. So if you're somewhat familiar with Morse code, um, so every, every symbol is encoded in a sequence of dots and dashes. And E being a very, very frequent letter in English, it's going to have a very short code. It's really just one dot. And Q, which is just a very, very unusual letter in English. Well, not completely, but it's going to have a much longer code. I think it has three or four uh, dots or dashes. So the average number of bits needed to encode anything is uh, at least as big as the entropy of X. So this gives you a theoretical limit for compression algorithms or a way to encode things. So this actually raises an interesting question. What's the entropy of English? So we'll go into how um, we can actually estimate models of English. So these are all models. How likely is this sentence of English? How likely is that sentence of English? And basically, we, we're going to spend the entire next lecture about figuring out what's the probability of a word given its previous words. Can we estimate that in a model that can guess this really good? is a much better model and uh, again a model that has a fairly kind of skewed probability distribution with some very strict preferences it's going to have lower entropy so if we build models with a limited window size um, we can actually check how entropy evolves um, these are some numbers from some models that are built uh, zeroth order model. So this is a model that's just unigram model. So you just predict one word independent of anything that happened before. That's the entropy you get 4.76. If you look at the previous word, so you can always say, well, the previous word was the, what can you guess next? That reduces entropy. If you're allowed to look at the two previous words, that reduces things as possible. And then uh, humans, how well can they predict what the next word will be? Uh, so this is a bit the theoretical limit. It's 1.3. So we're actually going to explain where we get this from, how we can estimate these probabilities. And uh, um, this is, uh, we pretty much laid all the groundwork today on the methods we're going to use for that. We're just going to apply them to a, a real language problem. And actually, this is already a very, very powerful tool for natural language processing. And it also introduces uh, really ch interesting challenges for machine learning. So a lot of the things that I've talked about machine learning, uh, sparse data, we already alluded to that with Ziff's law. There are a lot of words that are just super rare. Um, smoothing, back off interpolation, um, we'll explain what that is. So how do you balance different kind of distributions to each other? Um, all these have been explored in great detail in language modeling. So stay tuned for the next lecture coming to a computer screen near you.